Please be seated. Deans, Deputy Deans, Heads of Departments, Members of Senate, Students, Family and Friends of Professor Privek, Honored Guests, Colleagues and Friends. Molweni, Huyanand, Bonsoir. Dumelang, guten Abend, good evening, and a very warm welcome to you all to Professor Privet's professorial inaugural address. I extend a special welcome to the family, friends, collaborators, and colleagues of Professor Privet, some of whom have joined this special university celebration via digital platforms. This time-honored tradition with origins in the medieval university serves as an introduction and an induction of new professors and as a platform to showcase their scholarly contributions to their discipline. It is also an occasion in which we, as academic peers, colleagues, students, family, friends, and the public celebrate the intellectual and scholarly achievements and contribution of one of our own. Promotion of, or appointment to the rank of full professor marks a significant milestone in an academic's prof professional and intellectual career. On behalf of our university council, and the entire Rhodes University community, I offer our warm and heartfelt congratulations to you, Professor Privet, on your promotion to the rank of full professor of Rhodes University and for reaching the pinnacle of your career in the academy. Honored guests, on an occasion like this, we introduce our new professor fully. So I have the distinct honor of presenting to you one of our newest additions to the illustrious community of scholars who hold the position of full professor of Rhodes University, one Stevek, Stephen Privek. Stephen was born and raised in Southern Ontario, Canada, into a family with mining connections, which is likely where his interest in geology developed. He was an avid ice hockey player. Since moving to South Africa, Professor Privet's love of music and talent has led him to perform at National Arts Festival, acoustic cafe, and other music events. He is currently the first trombone of the Makana Community Orchestra. He is also a whiz in archery and has competed and won at provincial level. He's married to Dr. Rosemary Privek, a research associate in our Department of Botany, and has two children. Professor Privet completed a BSc Honours degree, a higher standard of a four-year degree, and an MSc, an MSc degree in geology at McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario. He did his honours and master's projects under the supervision of Dr. Robert McNutt, a Canadian isotope geochemist, who was a big influence in his life. Steve's father, 
Dr. Ludwig, Ludwig Privick was a life sciences professor there. So that was obviously an influence on his choosing academia in the first place. Steve worked as a lab assistant throughout undergraduate studies starting at the end of his first year. He was part of a relatively large geology class of about 50 students, the largest in the history of the geology department. They all knew from the end of the first year that they were all geology majors. He specialized in radioisotope geochemistry right from the second year, working in the lab and learning the theory and techniques. His PhD was completed at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, under the supervision of Dr. Hafden Basgard. All of this research has involved, all of his research has involved the analysis of long lived radio radioactive isotopes as geological traces in rocks. While finishing his PhD in his spare time, he was employed as a geochronologist by the Geological Survey of Canada in Ottawa, and then setting up isotope analytical facilities at the Research Institute Geotop at the University of Quebec in Montreal. After completing his PhD, he undertook a postdoctoral research contract at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada for four years. Thereafter, he took up the post of research officer at the famous Bernard Price Institute of Geophysical Research at the University of Edwardstrom, Johannesburg, a move which ultimately led him to our university. It was in 2004, after six years at WITS, that he accepted an offer from the Department of Geology at Rhodes University, making him a long serving member of almost 20 years in the Department of Geology. Professor Privet says that he got to know about Rhodes University through the SciFest, in which he had participated every year. And because of the profiles of some of the staff members, Professor Ills, Professor Unimash, and Professor Moore, while he was still at VETS. His research involves the use of radioisotopes, geochemistry, and rock and mineral textural information to decipher the evolution of rocks, mostly associated with giant impact craters or ore deposits, or sometimes both, and usually from intrusions of magma from melting of the Earth's mantle. In his many years with us, he has taken on several different roles. He was the manager of the electronic micros, uh, microprobe analytical facility for many years. Is a current and long serving member of Senate and was both acting head and head of the geology department for many years. Outside of his extensive involvement with our university, he's a member of various professional societies, such as the Geological Association of Canada, Geological Society of South Africa, where he is also the Eastern Cape representative, the Mineralogical Society of South Africa and of Canada, and the Society of Economic Geologists. He's also a founder member of the Igneous and Metamorphic Studies Group, of which he remains the Executive General, General Secretary. Over the years, Professor Privek has reviewed approximately 70 journal articles and two field trip guidebooks. He has also had 36 published papers in refereed journals, 
generally reviewed outputs and book chapters. Until recently, Professor Privek was the associate editor for the South African Journal of Geology. He is the current Minsa Yacht Quarterly Magazine editor and became the co-editor of the International Canadian Mineralogist Journal last year. Professor Privek is currently supervising one PhD and five MSc students. He has supervised or co-supervised approximately 40 postgraduate student projects. This includes serving as the primary supervisor of one graduated PhD project to date, seven master's projects, and numerous honors projects. He has participated as a judge in several Eastern Cape Science Fairs since 2005, and has been the organizer, administrator, and team leader of Rhodes Geology Contribution to the National Science Festival for many years as well. Since 2012, he has conducted annual geology talks and career garden sessions at local schools. Professor Privek has also facilitated internships for high school students in his department. And now honored guests, colleagues and friends, it is my greatest pleasure to invite Professor Privik to present his professorial inaugural lecture titled, Negotiating the Paradigm Shifts of the Earth Sciences, Igneous Rocks, or Deposits and Impact Cratering, or My Four Decades of Geological Pursuits. Are we there yet? Professor Privek. Thank you very much, Professor Mabizela. It was a very thorough introduction. Turn that off. We are already recording. I think I need to share screen. It's already sharing. You're in business. Okay. So the the theme of my presentation is is going to be um, kind of how I how I came to be a geologist. Um, the what what sort of made me a geologist, what kept me as a geologist, um, with specific reference throughout, and most of this was kind of realized retrospectively, the contributions of Canadian geology and South African geology to the field that I've ended up in. Um, I would begin with the caveat. I was asked to write the abstract about two weeks ago for advertising purposes, which is well before I worked on the talk. And normally, yeah, when you write a paper, the abstract is the last thing you write. So um, on, on advice of counsel, I'm not going to uh, go on on all three of these kind of paradigm shifts that I had thought maybe I would, but I'll mention everything so there's no false advertising. Um, slides. Uh, so this was my uh, my CV slide. This this picture I was actually doing field work for my PhD, but I was on my way to a wedding. So I posed for the picture. So just looking at the history of geology, I just did a kind of survey of geology departments. I think this is going to be. how Madonna does it. Um, I was trying to find the oldest departments. Um, so the earliest geology departments um, formed basically to do with fossils, where they were paleontology departments. 
Um, and it was in the mid to late 1800s that geology as its kind of so, sort of modern form started appearing. So the sort of really prominent departments globally, like the University of Chicago in the US, um, Oxford, are still only really like less than 15, 20 years before the department at Rhodes started. So the field was just getting started really at the time of the appointment of uh, Professor Schwartz here at, at Rhodes. And the two universities that I did my degrees at, initially they were at about the same time or just a little bit behind. So as a field, geology is relatively young. Geochemistry, which is my sort of main area, um, this is a slide I use in my undergraduate lectures. This is early geochemistry was much simpler. There were only four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. That looks like a fairly typical kind of geological conference. Too many white males, a few of the worst for wear. Um, so um, geochemistry in its modern form started taking shape during the kind of dark ages, middle ages, in the form of alchemy, of the efforts to transform base metals, so relatively valueable but malleable metals into precious metals, things like gold and silver. This never happened. Um, okay, this isn't gonna work. Go back to this. Okay, so alchemy was the attempt to transform one element into another. So as it turns out, in Paris in the late 1800s, Henri Becquerel, along with um, Pierre Curie and Maria Sklodowska, who became later much better known as Marie Curie, having after marrying Pierre um, and becoming a French citizen. Oh, it said it was shared at the beginning. Out. Spoil the surprise. <laughs> okay. So yeah, they worked in Henri Becquerel's lab. Pierre Curie was working on magnetism. But it was Marie that actually discovered, well, Pierre had discovered the first radioactive elements. He discovered thorium. Marie discovered radium and discovered the uranium decay chain. And um, so, yeah, it was technically mother nature here that was actually doing the conversion of metals into another metal. Um, so here's our uranium ore. And it was Marie that discovered that it was radioactive. Now, the some of the side effects were discovered very fairly quickly. Others only uh, discovered later on. There's supposed to be sound that goes with this. Um, okay, anyway. So, uh, yeah, as a result of that, um, it was worked out that there are various types of radioactive decay. Um, there's five different ways an atom, so it's a natural process that we cannot affect. We can affect one of these slightly, um, electron capture. The, but these are spontaneous processes that happen to most atoms that we know, most types of atoms that we are aware of. Um, and radioactive parent atoms decay to radiogenic, born of radioactivity, daughter atoms. So this terminology, has been around since the beginning. I don't know why it's a parent turning to a daughter, not a mother to a daughter or a parent to a child, um, but that's the way it is. Um, so, yep, radioactivity. So from the 50s, in fact, right after it was discovered, it was already being used to tell the age of rocks and it was being used as a medical treatment, like within five years of it being discovered. 
um, and relatively successfully, although in very basic ways. So all of this kind of popular culture stuff that came out afterwards came as a result of kind of what are the dangers of radioactivity and what are the potential benefits, but mainly the dangers, particularly after World War II, when some of the dangers had become evident. So, yeah, well, each of these involved a slightly different radiogenic byproduct. Um, so my undergrads get this. They don't get examined on it, though. So, so, yeah, so all of the uranium on the planet Earth will eventually become lead. There will be no uranium left. And you may think, well, don't we, don't we still want some uranium to use as a fuel source, for example? Um, it doesn't matter, because by the time we run out of uranium, the sun will have exploded. Um, we will not be concerned. So, yeah, so what's the relevance of this to geology and to my career in geology? Um, there is a very elegant, so I'm not going to make you do calculus here, but I want to demonstrate that I can. Um, <laughs> so if we start with the fundamental premise that you have a certain number, capital N, of radioactive atoms, over time it will decay away and it'll become the daughter. So we can express this as a, uh, um, a rate of change expression. The rate of change of N atoms with time equals a negative number because it's getting smaller and the rate it decays at, the speed of decay, we represent by a constant. And that constant is what we call the decay constant. We can relate that to the half-life, which is what people are more familiar with. So starting with this very basic expression, which is really just saying this atom gets smaller over time. The amount, number of atoms gets smaller over time. Um, you, we can integrate that to get rid of the unpleasantness there of a differential equation. Um, so the basic principles of determining the age of rocks is based on this very simple principle. But what we need to know is um, how many daughter elements were there already in the system we're considering. So those elements, as soon as the star blew up that made them, they are decaying all the time. But we sort of trap the parents in a rock, say, at a certain temperature, and then we trap the daughters that are forming, and that becomes our little clock. Um, so we need to know, though, how many of the daughter elements were already in there. And this was kind of caused, this caused problems for decades. So, yeah, so not knowing how many inherited daughters are in the system stopped us from using this widely in useful rock types. So you could use it on very specific minerals like uranium ores, um, the minerals that only had the parent element in them, like uranium ores, which, okay, that was a very important thing in the 50s, um, but geologically speaking, a very restricted field. So, uh, yeah, this is a slide from my master's course. Here's our inherited daughters. So, yeah, we need to know how many inherited daughters, or we can't use this method widely. So the solution was we applied some algebra to our initial little bit of calculus. And very clever people actually at Witts University discovered that all they're doing is rearranging the equation. We're replacing the things we can't measure, like how many original parent atoms there were by things we can measure, like the daughters now. And they worked out that this little thing is it, uh, the expression for a straight line. And that was this revelation in 1961. This work was done at Witz by Louis Nicolaisen and his team there. Um, Louis was still there when I arrived in South Africa in 98. Um, we, were, we became friends. He, he died at about 10 years after that, I guess, um, at, a, at a ripe old age. Um, but it's this kind of, I was taught this diagram as the Nicolaisen diagram. It's now become, that term has fallen away. It's called the isochron diagram because the line joining points of equal age is called an isochron. But it was this revelation that the intercept at the left tells you the initial composition of the daughter product in the system. So you don't have to be able to measure it. You can mathematically calculate. And that opened it up completely. So now we're up into the 80s and my honors thesis work in Arctic Canada, so where the, the dot is showing, involved, I'd already been working in the lab for three years at this point. So 
It involved attempting to determine an age for rocks. I got my little isochron, which is not a very good isochron because it's a clump of points and then another point. So it's like two points. So I then took another rock and sliced it up into uh, seven slices, each with slightly different mineralogical characteristics. And I got a much better line with a different age. And in retrospect, all of these ages have turned out to be correct, just not really precise enough to publish. It's definitely not now. Um, this was from my masters in Eastern Canada, in Eastern Labrador. Um, I was looking at rocks where the minerals were reacting with other minerals around them. And what we see here is these reaction rims or coronas where new minerals are forming. And I actually crushed these rocks up and sort of dissected these minerals and made isochrons. So this is from my first paper. Um, from my master's work, it's, these are just a few of the many, many isochrons in this diagram using both the system I'd kind of been trained on, rubidium strontium, and the one where that diagram was developed at WITS. And this new system, which was just being developed, it had only been used on lunar rocks in the 70s. And we were, we were among the first labs in Canada to develop this. And I was getting to work with people from um, Paris who were bringing over some of the, the materials to do the chemical separation. It was sort of like Freemasons. You had to know the right guy and you would get this little bag of white shredded Teflon and that came from Paris. And so yeah, and then the publications, yes, that I felt obliged to mention, we had to hand draw all these diagrams. I know for the other more senior professors that might not be such a revelation, but this all had to be hand drafted and we're using this kind of letra set that you um, pencil onto your things. So it shows. This was my, this has always been my favorite petrological picture. It's from my masters. It's one of these minerals surround, uh, surrounded by another mineral and reacting, and it just happens to have a twin across the middle. So it's always been my favorite. I use it wherever I can. So one of the things that was attractive about geology was getting to go out into the field and, and observe and sample rocks. So being out in nature and often in relatively obscure places. So this is my first, wasn't my first summer job sort of thing, but it was my first time really in a geological fields crew, which we called a field party. One of my friends was pointing out that like the, the leader of the group's called the party chief, but he's not, they're not party people. Um, um, they're the grown ups. So this is just, this is in the Arctic in Canada. This is just on a morning traverse where we're off to do our, whatever, 15 kilometers of walking and collecting rocks and the fog had yet to burn off on the side of this lake. The temperature up there was about five degrees the whole summer. Um, we were in heavy duty sort of windproof clothing that is snow in the picture on the rocks. So these were some of, these were some of the rocks I did my honors project on. They're rocks that are partially melting or have been partially melted. I realized when I was putting this together that there's a bit of a melting theme in my research. This is one of my earliest animal pictures. This is before you moved to South Africa and discovered that there's lots of animals. That's an, that's an owl standing on the ground about 50 meters away. And I think it's huge. My memory is that it was sort of like a meter tall and it's still in its winter plumage because the snow had just melted. So the, over the summer, it would, they would convert and become brown. But within two months, it would be snowing again. So I did see, we did see caribou. We were on a kind of, we're not on a main migration route. There were some that were still white, some were still, some were brown. This was my first time also being, um, there was five of us. We kind of knew there's no other humans for a hundred kilometers in any direction. There's no little settlements. We knew where the nearest places were. Um, you had to come in by plane or helicopter. A plane brought us in and landed on the lake we were, on because it was still iced up. And then over the summer that melted and we fished out of it for our food. This was my masters working in Eastern Labrador. That's me at my hunkiest there. Um, so that's, I'm sitting in a helicopter. We went out every day in a helicopter to be dropped off. That was our field crew. That's what happens to boots after one summer in the field. You'd buy them at the beginning and throw them away at the end. Um, but it was a very, yeah. That your connection with your, you're working with people who have a few years experience and then a party chief who does this for a living. So there's a whole little hierarchy of training. Um, 
And that's how you acquire your skills. This is from my PhD then, where I was um, sampling with one assistant. I did this over two summers with different assistants. Um, so yep, camping in the field, going out every day and collecting samples and uh, recognizing and describing rocks. This is much more recent. This is from about less than 10 years ago, but just to show this up. This is my favorite sampling season is autumn. Um, so we're out, this is how we have to collect these samples. A lot of the time um, is with a rock saw. Um, and my colleague there is pouring water on the, the blade so it doesn't overheat and get destroyed. Um, um, the other hazard for Canadian uh, geology, okay, bears are a minor hazard, but bears normally, if you're hitting the rocks with a hammer, the bear hears you, it knows you're there, it goes away. If you're sampling in um, October, it's hunting season, so which is why I'm wearing orange as well, so the bears are scarce. Those are black flies, the famous bane of the Canadian, uh, well, of Canada, let's say. So there's a couple of black flies busy there, and then there's some of their work. So that leads us to some animal pictures, just to show we're, we're interconnecting with wildlife. So there's a chipmunk that we found occupying our coffee pot in the morning. That's from when I was doing my PhD, Sudbury. The little lizard is from work I was doing in China. So he's a, also probably a happy lizard because obviously he escaped a near-death experience, lost his tail and grew it back. And it's the first time I'd ever seen that. I don't read about it, but I'd never seen that before. Um, the snake on the left is probably not thrilled about this, but uh, he a, was a harmless snake. We just took a picture and he, off he went. This bear is very unhappy. Um, it was turned inside out by a truck. It was on an outcrop that we needed to look at. And this is from South Africa. This is the smallest frog I've ever seen. That's from a year or two ago. So what I want to talk about briefly here are the people that kind of influenced me as I was getting started in my career. So that's why I've put them in this part of the talk um, before my career re was really getting going because that's by the time I was, for example, at WITS or here, I was pretty much committed to geology. So it's the people that you meet at the beginning that you respect and admire and you think, I, I know them from their work or I know of their work. Um, so you know they're good scientists and you think, and you know, they're the kind of person that you think, yeah, that, that's the kind of life I could aspire to. Um, I, didn't have, I didn't work for people that were really high powered A type people that you, you admire, but fear and are like, it's a good experience, but I don't wanna be that. So I was very lucky with the kind of people I ran across. So Bob McNutt was my, um, essentially my boss for the three years I was an undergrad. I just went to the department at the end of the first year and I said, are there sort of part-time jobs? Like I was like um, re-cataloging stuff at the beginning, then sort of making sample, preparing samples for X-ray fluorescence analysis. So using a scale, using a Bunsen burner. And by the end of the summer, I was running a mass spectrometer and I did my honors project under his supervision. And then I did my master's under his supervision as well. And then I moved, moved elsewhere. Um, and he, what I particularly remember learning from him and having him in the field with me during my master's was his ability to sort of listen to what you're telling him and then ask the question that cut right to the crucial element of the problem. So to be able to sort of see through the bushes and find the, the key questions. So I've always tried to emulate that. While I was working for Bob, Larry Heeman was a PhD student. And Larry was a very careful, meticulous chemist and a very meticulous person. And he's gone on. He actually took the job of my PhD supervisor when he retired. And Larry has now had a fantastic career in Canada. A lot of age dating of Kimberlites and things. Um, and he was a big influence on me. Alan Dickin was a, a professor that arrived as I started my master's. And he was a fresh graduate from England. And yeah, he was a very, very energetic, very curious. Um, he's a very interesting guy. He is a, a very devout Christian at the same time as being a very active isotope geochemist working on ancient rocks. And he doesn't let that slow him down. He writes books on reconciling the Bible with 
our observations. Um, so it hasn't cramped his style at all. If anything, it's stimulated him. My PhD supervisor was Afton Bud Badsgaard. Um, he was from Minnesota, but of uh, Danish extraction. Um, he was an interesting guy. I and mean, he, he was a chemist from the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, I learned a lot of sort of, uh, yeah, chemical lab procedure, but also this kind of very sort of benign curiosity in how to manage a lab from him. Then I had the good fortune to work in the Geological Survey of Canada lab, um, picking zircons and learning how geochronology worked from people who were doing this for a living. I was busy writing my PhD and not in a big rush about it. And I worked for Jim. We, were, we, we pioneered various techniques. Jim would come up with ideas like, well, let's etch this with hydrofluoric acid. And I would set up a, like with my pen knife and some Tupperware, we would set up stuff. Um, and then that evolved into other techniques that are now mainstream ones. Um, so I was only there for a couple of years. It was a very interesting lab to work in. I went to Montreal from there, and I, worked, I was hired by Clément Garriepi, whose name I knew from the literature, to help set up a lab for Ross Stevenson, who was a couple of years older than me. And I'd met him at a conference, and he was struggling to get his lab operating. So they, they whisked me over, said, no, 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 don't worry about finishing your PhD. We need you right now. Um, and that went fine. I, I, we got Ross's lab running. I got my PhD done, made very good friends, got introduced to this kind of French culture. Um, which I wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. And then actually my PhD external examiner was Richard James here, working at Sudbury. So I hadn't met him before. You're not allowed to know your ex external examiners in our system. And um, we became very good friends later on. Every time I go back to Canada, I try to go to Sudbury. I go back and stomp around the rocks from my PhD area or my postdoc area from later. And Dick is always game to come into the field even though, yeah, I don't know, he must be getting close to 80 himself. Um, and then just my colleagues throughout all these processes. There's a, this is a group of us. I'm the geeky looking one on the right. Um, these are, we were all, I just happened to have our birthdays at the same, in the Scorpio window. Um, the two guys in the middle are one, the guy with the glasses next to me there, Steve Johnston was a, a lecturer at uh, Durban Westville when I came here for my interview at WITS. And I spent a week with him too, and that partly convinced me to come to South Africa. Um, everybody in that picture, everybody graduated, and most of them are prominent in their fields. And that kind of inspires you as you're going along. It makes you feel like you're part of something. Alberta was a much bigger department than where I did my undergrad. There was 40 or 50 postgrad students instead of 20. So I'm just going to jump back to my honors work briefly here. Um, most of the, we, we had very limited helicopter time. So this is the helicopter we had access to every once in a while, but helicopter time is very expensive. So my, our party chief, another is Norwegian, I think this time, Mikkel Shaw, we had a plane and we wanted to drop a whole bunch of equipment, like two tents, a stove and a whole bunch of food about 30 kilometers away we would drop two of these big bags. And then you would walk there, then, sap, then go mapping from that spot for a week, then move it, come back, and another group would go out. But we didn't have, we didn't have a helicopter, so the plane couldn't land anywhere. So they took the door off the plane, put all the stuff in bags, a big bag for each, like a big Grinch Santa Claus type bag, and threw it out the plane. And we got the report that one of the bags had stayed intact, the other had smashed open and scattered. And it turned out the smashed open and scattered bag was the good one because the, sh the shock wasn't absorbed by the contents of the bag. We went to the one that had stayed intact and this is what we found. So this was our, our little gas stove. You had to basically pump it constantly. So this was just like pump, 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 take a thing, take the picture. And you got these huge flames instead of the nice little blue flame you're supposed to have. So we kind of made it work. Then we moved it. And it was just over, uh, it was about 50 kilos that we were carrying, but I was young and fit. So, but that was our normal kind of uh, working gear too. Basically kind of all weather rain gear where it's just above zero. 
So this is leading me to the concept of impacts is where we're going next. This picture I substituted at the last second. This is from the, the final cutscene from the Iron Man movie. This is Thor's hammer making an impact crater. However, um, Sudbury, where I was, uh, my PhD area was around Sudbury and my, um, uh, postdoc was at Sudbury working on the impact rocks. Um, the idea that Earth could have been hit by meteorites was not a novel one in itself. Everybody is quite fine and has always been fine with the concept that in the early few millions or hundreds of millions of years of Earth history, it was formed by intensive meteorite bombardment. But it's kind of assumed that since the development of our atmosphere, that process is was minimal or non-existent. We see comets all the time. Here's a picture I took in 1997, standing about knee deep in snow outside of my house in Sudbury. And this is one from standing 10 kilometers north of Grahamstown from 2007. So these, doesn't matter if it's a comet or a meteorite, it has the same effect when it hits the ground. And um, we know that the moon has been hit by meteorites. We can see the craters, um, but, on Earth, this concept was not well accepted. Since the early 1960s, people had been proposing various circular structures as being impact craters. And before that, people assumed they were some kind of volcanic feature or occasionally a sinkhole. And the reason was, yeah, we had just finished in the 1800s, the idea that the, all of the rocks on the Earth were things that precipitated out of the great flood from the Bible. We had just kind of come out of that, almost within people's living memories into the mid-1900s. So we were not keen to go back to big catastrophes as um, earth-changing events. And you may think, well, what about earthquakes and volcanoes? Those are catastrophes. But those are kind of catastrophes on the scale of human lifespans, but not geologically. They're kind of happening constantly. And now that we have plate tectonics as a mechanism for how things are working, um, we kind of know what drives them. So we know that that's why there's a volcano and an earthquake. It's going to happen sometime on a regular interval. So it's not a catastrophe in the random event sense. However, um, NASA, for example, accepted the possibility that there were terrestrial craters. So craters, craters on Earth. They sent their astronauts before they sent them to the moon. They sent them to look at the Ries Crater in Germany, for example. These are the astronauts in a tower that's actually made of impact rock called Daniel um, in uh, a town in southwestern Germany in Bavaria. Um, so there they are hoisting a pint. This is the town. It's one of these a few remaining entirely walled cities, uh, Nerdlingen. Um, the crater is just outside the town. The town has a very interesting little story associated with it. All over the town, there are these um, decorated pigs. And it turns out, yes, the town was saved from invasion because uh, a woman's pig escaped and it scuttled out a door that, to the city that was not meant to be open. And they discovered that uh, somebody had been bribed to leave that door open to let the invaders in. And because of the pig, they discovered this before it was too late. Um, according to the, my notes on this slide, the, the person who left the door open was questioned then quartered. <laughs> and anyway, the pigs have been venerated ever since. And she was given free rent in the city for the rest of her life. So this is the crater. This is all the material that was thrown up by the impact and then fall, fell back in. It's a rock type called suavite. There are big bombs of volcanic material, these giant blocks that were thrown out as well. So we use that term for volcanoes and for impact. So that, that's what the big chunks are. Um, this was Gene Cernan. He was the only astronaut sent that was actually a geologist. And here he's actually looking at impact rocks in Sudbury. And this was again, in the, this was in the early 70s when this model was still uh, not widely accepted. And there he, he is on the moon, putting it into practice. Um, but what changed everybody's minds was the uh, discovery of comet Shoemaker or Schumacher Levy 9 in 1993. So Gene and Caroline Shoemaker, and at the same time, 
Daniel Vivi, who I just discovered while creating this slide today that he was actually a Canadian amateur astronomer with a degree in English literature. But he's discovered about 32 comets. But so this was seen a year before it came into the solar system and it was predicted it was going to impact Jupiter. So um, we were, everybody, the scientific community was ready watching this. And then everybody got very disappointed because instead of the big impact, it was seen as it entered Jupiter's atmosphere, it broke up into a whole bunch of small bits and everybody thought, oh. And it turned out that was amazing because then all of those bits impacted Jupiter as it rotated. And we watched this happen over a week or so, a week or two, as I remember. And that, from then on, impacts on Earth, fine. That, that's what converted everybody. So my research in my, this, um, this is now my current research, which we'll talk briefly about. Um, this is work I'm doing with a colleague in the geology department, Stefan Budner, and a colleague in the math department, Dennis Polny, on different aspects of this. I just presented this at a conference this year as a keynote. Um, what we're looking at is the puddle of liquid that's produced when a meteorite, a big meteorite hits the planet. It vaporizes a bunch of stuff and it liquefies another little bit and then it breaks up everything underneath. So what we were trying to model is why do we seem to see two types of this melt as it goes down into the earth? Nobody, it had been recognized at Sudbury. It's important there because the middle one with all the bits in it also has major ore deposits. It's the world's largest nickel ore deposit. So this is what it would look like from the side. And this is what it looks like in the outcrops. So these are pictures from the field. So it's a, a quartz diorite, which is QD, and then an inclusion rich quartz diorite. Why are there these two species? So we investigated, we, I did some thermal modeling 20 years ago with a colleague at Witz, and we uh, showed what the effect of that hot magma would do to the rocks underneath it. And then Stefan and I examined these various thermal models and came up with a new model involving pressure from above, pushing these magmas down into the floor rocks. Um, I was presenting this and it's, this is a pertinent model. Um, and it's a very active ongoing discussion now. So the question I was asked by some colleagues who are then at the free state was, if we have a chunk of rock and it's sitting in this superheated impact melt and superheated just means, yeah, we've got enough heat to turn it into liquid and then a bunch more. Um, how long will that chunk survive? And I thought, well, surely that's basic first year engineering type problem. I'll just go online. Um, no. So first I did some energy budget calculations and that was sufficient to, so this is just to show that I can do math. Um, this is really just plugging in variables from physical databases and determining heat capacity and doing some en uh, uh, energy calculations. So that was a, essential to this publication, which we then put out. They've now moved to the Western Cape, some of them. Um, so then I went back to the problem they'd posed. We didn't need that for that particular paper. So then I went back and I, I worked at it for about four months. Then I gave up and went to the physics department and we spent about a week working on it there. And then they directed me to the maths department where I was introduced to a Canadian. Dennis Palmy. Um, so it turns out that yes, because the class is shrinking as it's being heated, you can't just put it in a spreadsheet and solve this. It's a special type of math problem called a Stefan problem. And so we have over the years, we, that turned into coffee every Friday and then gradually actually working on, we worked out, worked our way through various critical problems and we think we have a working model now. Um, so yeah, so we developed this model, it's in progress. We'll be working with our colleagues in the Western Cape to correlate it with observational data. We came up with observations which we hadn't, it's made sense, but we hadn't expected, like the initial melt will actually freeze to the outside of the class first, then it will start melting. Um, so we'll, these are rocks from Freydefort, which is another, it's the world's largest impact crater. It's located about an hour south of Johannesburg. Um, so we'll be working on explaining data on the distributions of class and how those magmas actually got there. So that's work in progress. Other work we've done on impact rocks involving um, students from Rhodes. 
um, builds on work I did as part of my PhD. Here's work with Dr. Badsgaard. Um, and this is using the mineral zircon. So zircons are, there are they are a gemstone, a cheap gemstone. So the, the woman with a cheap husband's best friend. Um, but they are the, they were kind of discovered in the early 70s as being the best tool for determining the age of a rock. Um, and the reason is that, so when usually when we're looking at them, they look like this and they're about a couple hundred microns long. They contain a little uranium, like a few hundred parts per million. So we're not in, at any radioactivity risk. Um, and they have no lead in them, which is what uranium turns into. And that makes them ideal. And we do a, a type of isochron that's specialized for lead and we can determine the age of a rock. So I did this as part of my PhD. So I went, this is part of me going back to Sudbury at a regular interval and talking to different people there. And I got directed to an outcrop I'd never been to because as a Canadian, there was a sign saying no trespassing. But I was told, no, if you go past that up the road, there's a radio tower. There's rocks that look like what you're looking for. And it turned out they probably aren't what I was looking for, but they were turned out to be much more interesting. So I discovered after being shown what melted rocks looked like around Sudbury by other colleagues, I was able to recognize them here. We collected samples. This is a master's student and I collecting. And what was meant to show up in these pictures is it, it's completely pouring rain, but it never shows up well in pictures, but we were completely soaked. So we actually could run this saw without actually having to put water on. It was really just really, really pouring. So what we discovered is the zircon grains in this rock, we found the normal kind of relatively happy ones we were expecting and probably what I had been dating before. And then we found these shocked ones. And these look like shocked zircons from other places, which has now been coined as friggin' zircons. Former readite in granular neoblastic zircon. So this was this is an American researcher who's based in Australia, Aaron Cavossi. So yeah, I, I, this was only discovered, the mineral readite was discovered about 10 years ago. And it's a high pressure version of zircon. So yeah, this a whole workshop full of people saying friggin' zircons. It's cute and amusing for about 10 minutes. But, so we think we have the same thing. Um, Aaron has offered to do the kind of analysis that I need to do to prove that they were readite because we can't do that in South Africa. So that's still the plan. Um, so I'll go just quickly through, this is the science part is more or less done. Um, the other kind of work that I do is on the igneous rocks that these zircons are found in. So it turns out we've been quite happy it's like since the 50s with how we think igneous rocks work. But in the last 20 or 30 years, those models have been questioned and are now in the process of being overturned to most people's view. So I'll, the old concept of magma would intrude from below. So it's coming from melting somewhere. You have to melt something to make this liquid. It comes up by buoyancy and pressure. And then it reaches a point in the upper crust where it decides it's easier to go sideways than up. And then it starts inflating and it sort of pushes the roof of the earth up but in the way that it's so small, we can't detect it. And then it starts cooling from the outside in. So crystals form. And then what we traditionally thought happened was that you'd get a little earthquake or something. And then the crystals would destabilize and they're denser than the liquid. So they would fall to the bottom and we would make interesting layered things. And then you get a new pulse of magma that comes in later. It sits on top of the old stuff. Where those magmas mix, you might get ore deposits like chromites. This is a big ore from South Africa. We are the world's main producer of it. It's an important part of steel. This work was also done on a foundation by Canadians. So here's my Canadian foundation. Norman Bowen, he's kind of the father of igneous petrology. Um, he worked for the Ontario Geological Survey originally and then went on to do um, experimental work at the University of Chicago in the early 1900s, right up till he died. Um, he developed all these ideas that a crystal will form and settle to the bottom of this pile, what we call fractional crystallization. And then a little later on, Neil Irvine, uh, this is the only picture I can find, it's from his university website from about 20 years ago. I believe he is still alive. 
and I'm guessing his age, um, but I think that's about right. A lot of the models that we use in our textbooks were developed by him in the late 60s and early 70s for how we form a lot of these ore deposits. And now all of these models are being questioned. Um, we believe now in something, well, many people believe in a model more like this, where the magmas just come in, you don't make a giant puddle at once, you inject it in in bits, possibly not in order, which is very controversial for some people. So this very heated, so-called, or so to speak, debate at all of these meetings now about these processes. So I'm not gonna go into it, except to say that I'm involved in it. And this makes you, you are part of knowledge creation. We are changing the way people think about it. So my little contributions here and there, I was invited to do a review um, article on the Bushveld complex, which is, it's the largest of these intrusions in the world. It's located in Northeastern South Africa. And I've had the good luck to be able to work on that with colleagues from Rhodes and from Witz. We published a paper on this a couple of years ago, which is what led to me then getting invited to become the editor of the journal, which was quite nice. Um, these are two of my former master's students. They did both graduate. So Savas Largatsis on the right and Yogendra Arunachalan on the left. Um, both working on Bushveld rocks. And then I've had a PhD student working in Southwestern China, who's now a professor at the University of Cape Town. That's Jeff Howarth, you'll see him in a second. Um, this is Wolf Meyer, not his best side. Um, he's a former Rhodes graduate as well, and he's now a professor in the UK. Um, so it's just being, being available and being useful. This is Jeff next to his pit in China. Um, so yeah, it's, um, this is Sia Sangha, who is here in the audience working on her PhD. So this is from the Bushveld as well. She's collecting samples at a core yard in Mokopane. Here she is happier uh, in the, in, back in the Eastern Cape. Um, so from a teaching perspective, since I said I would say something about teaching, how do you teach a subject that's kind of constantly reinventing? Can you just take what we think now, like what's in the textbooks now, just teach that and sort of pretend the stuff we used to think was right, not worry about so much. You can't really do that effectively for geology because in most fields of geology, there are fields that are very young, but most fields in geology, we are using ideas that were developed in 1910, 20, and we've just supplemented them with new stuff but we have not got rid of the old stuff, it's still good. Um, so we are, we are combining bits of information from all these things and then replacing the bits that are wrong. But some of the bits that are wrong are still in the modern textbooks and are still being published. So you have to be really on top of what you're doing as a lecturer. So it's important then to teach the students that you are, yeah, like, so by, like, in honor is basically, I teach them why everything I taught them in third year was probably not right but here's why kind of thing. Um, and this is now our best, our best bet. And here's the papers that discuss it. So we try to make them clear that this is an ongoing dynamic process of learning and that our, their lecturers and their predecessors as students are the ones making these changes. And I would like to just briefly highlight the contribution from a Rhodes graduate from 30 years ago now. Um, Rochelle Wigley um, did her degrees here, geology and chemistry. Then she got a job with the Council for Geoscience in Belleville, Cape Town, and ended up getting involved in ocean floor mapping. And she took a little one year, kind of like the best student gets invited from like 10 different countries. She took this course and she went back about five years later and became the director of this institute. And then she led the team that won a bid for a remote ocean floor mapping um, vessel and yeah they didn't do much during COVID but they are now they've now mapped something like 15 it's I think it was eight percent of the seafloor had been mapped prior to this which is why it was identified as a, a worthy target now it's something like 20 something percent has been mapped and their um, their little boat is an essential part of all this so this is the kind of thing I point out to the students like it's working hard, being at the right place and taking your opportunities. So yeah, so my 
as I wrote this and just, just discussing this with Stefan, we realized, yeah, it's having a grounding in field-based geology. Then I had probably 20 years of lab work sort of overlapping. Started doing teaching when I was, yeah, as a senior postdoc and then doing research all that time. So you're combining elements of all those things. Yeah, and just, yeah, being interested in everything you can. So here's just some examples of non-research based things. Last year, I was invited to present something on South African geoheritage. I've presented things on educational philosophy from a vaguely geological perspective, um, community engagement. I took the Rhodes course a couple of years ago. All these things are really interesting. You may or may not end up using a lot of it, but it gets you thinking about all this stuff. Um, I got involved in my, I was invited to start uh, being the editor of the Mineralogical Society's magazine about eight years ago now. I had previously been the editor of the Geological Society's magazine for about 10 years. And then that was a lot different sort of work. This is a lot more fun. Um, and then, yeah, I got invited to be the editor or the co-editor of this journal. So with my colleagues, there's a, a former colleague from Sudbury that I, we only briefly overlapped there. I didn't know him very well. He's the one that invited me. Then the young lady on the left, who looks like she's about 14. She's actually about 40. Um, she's our production manager. She makes the, the wheels go around really. Um, then, yeah, having things that keep you sane the rest of the time. Uh, so work-life balance, there's the orchestra that was mentioned earlier. There's uh, Stefan and I at the back there. Um, and then of course, my family, um, without whom I definitely would not still be here, I'm sure, or be sane. Um, so without them, uh, yes, a big thank you to them. Um, So that's it. I do, I do have one final slide. I, 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 was, uh, I had an email uh, from Professor Mabuzela this morning asking about uh, influences. And then I, it occurred to me, oh yeah, my dad, um, who was a professor. Not only though was he a professor, he actually did his undergrad degree in geology and physics. And then somehow he has explained this to me and I never remember how this works. He then went into life sciences having never taken undergraduate biology courses, and then the rest of his career as a life scientist. So this was, a, he did field work in Labrador, the same general part of the world I did. This is some, there's a motor on the back that you can't see. So uh, this is him as a 20 something year old in the field doing geology. So he did geology as a kind of hobby when he was uh, in later years in his life. Um, so I think he encouraged me to become a geologist, although didn't really push it. And I only discovered this year that my grandfather, his father, when he first came over from what was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that it became Yugoslavia and then Slovenia, he came over in the 20s to Canada and worked in the Sudbury mines, which I hadn't known when I was working in Sudbury. So yeah, we have this mining connection history that I was actually unaware of till very recently. So that is the end. Thank you very much. Super. Steve, thank you. Um, thank you for introducing yourself to us. Um, there's a, a lot of humanity in what you've just spoken to us. There's also a lot of science. Um, a 40 year journey um, is really what it is. I see a lot of young, young students in the audience. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I want the take home message that I think that you should take home is that it takes time. Um, you developing questions, you are questioning what you read. Um, so here we have an, a, a fantastic example of a discipline which is evolving extremely rapidly and with observation, clever ideas, um, hypotheses, and, um, and good old, old fashioned science is that you're creating new theory. Thank you, Steve. Um, here's a little token of thanks from us. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's small.
It's purple. It's proudly purple. And congratulations on your, professor, your professorship. You deserve it. Um, and you epitomize the scholar teacher model that we have. You are creating knowledge, which you can within a couple of years impart to your students. So they're very lucky to have you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have some refreshments outside. Um, please join us outside and have a chat to the prof. Thank you. Thanks for coming.